It is my great pleasure to introduce Liz Matsushita. Liz is a PhD candidate in history at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She specializes in Middle Eastern and North African history, colonialism and post-colonialism, race and ethnicity, and music. Her research performs a critical history of musicology in the early to mid 20th century, focusing on French musical projects in North Africa and based on archival research in both traditional and sonic archives in Morocco, Tunisia, France, Egypt, and Lebanon. Her work has been supported by Fulbright, FLAS, AIMS, and the Illinois Graduate College. And she will defend her dissertation titled Disharmony of Empire, Race and the Making of Modern Musicology in Colonial North Africa in Spring 2021. She is currently a fellow at the Humanities Research Institute in Illinois. So please help me welcome Liz, if visually. Uh, so Liz, when you're ready. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and share my screen. One moment. All right, so first I just wanted to say thank you to all of the musical encounters across the Strait of Gibraltar study group for this invitation to speak and this opportunity to share my research. Um, I really enjoyed this speaker series thus far um, and it's really an honor to be able to participate alongside such incredible scholars and to share my work today. Um, so before I begin, I just wanted to say a few words about my work and what I'm gonna be presenting. So as, uh, as Samuel said, I'm a PhD candidate in the history department at the University of Illinois. Uh, my dissertation is on the history of musicology in colonial North Africa, um, focusing on Morocco. Um, and specifically in my dissertation, I underscore the ways in which the study and promotion of uh, North African musics form strategic components of colonial governance and control. Um, and also racialized the North African population uh, in ways that often served colonial aims. So, and then I also examined the musicological scholarship produced by North Africans um, and the broader Arabic intellectual world that they were a part of, uh, especially in Cairo and Beirut, and how this scholarship underwrote nationalist, both local and pan-Arab nationalist uh, projects and made claims for an Arabic genealogy of European knowledge. So while my research thus far has then primarily been focused on music and musicology. Um, along the way, I've become very interested in this category of sound um, and the ways that it too is entangled with uh, colonial surveillance and governance, race and racialization, and anti or counter colonial projects. Um, and I see this as part of uh, a broader uh, trend um, and a move towards urban histories that engage sound, um, including Samuel work on Madrid um, and Ziad Fahmi's recent book on Cairo. Um, and basically sound is a very uh, crucial and constitutive component of the colonial encounter. Uh, in particular, travel accounts are frequently filled with sonic descriptions, often illustrating the strangeness or the overwhelmingness of the foreign and the non-Western. And um, it's at the same time often overlooked or has been in the past overlooked in scholarship due to its ephemeral qualities. So today I ask, beyond merely being descriptive, how did sound serve as a historical force and an actor in historical encounters? What can we learn about historical processes by adjusting our lens to accommodate the sonic and the ephemeral? Um, and also if we conceptualize Tangier here as a border zone or a liminal zone, um, what does a border sound like? Um, and what does liminality sound like? And how is it constructed via sound? Um, and how do these sounds also act as forces both at that border and beyond in the kind of discrete sites that supposedly come together to form the border here, Africa and Europe. So the city of Tangier often emerges as one of the richest sites of encounter in the colonial geography of North Africa, and not surprisingly also one of the noisiest. Tangier is often set up as many things in European and American travel accounts as a border crossing transgressive site, as a last outpost of Western civilization and comfort before penetrating the real Morocco beyond, uh, and also as an entry point into an otherworldly Africa, which Africa I'm putting in scare quotes because 
as we will see, what was meant by Africa was very much mutable and in flux. So this was all due, no doubt, to many things. Uh, for one thing, as a bustling port city, Tangier was a place of constant movement between countries and continents, and it served as a point of entry for many foreign travelers. For another, over the period from the mid 19th to the early 20th century, the city's population grew and became significantly more diverse. In the early 19th century, Tangier was a relatively minor town of about 6,000 inhabitants. Um, and it was both geographically and politically distant from the Moxen or government administration centers in Fez and Marrakesh. By the early 20th century, however, it had grown from 6,000 to about 40,000 people by 1904. Over this period, waves of European migrants shifted the demography and character of the city, uh, along with internal migration from Morocco's rural areas and interior cities. Tangier's reputation as a kind of liminal zone was only enhanced in the colonial period, uh, namely in 1923, when it was named an international zone to be jointly administered by France, Spain, and Britain. Uh, which it remained until 1956. And in this way, it kind of existed alongside the French and Spanish protectorates in Morocco, which were both established in 1912, while also retaining an extraordinary and quasi extraterritorial status. So my talk today will be primarily focusing on the early 20th century, leading up to and following the Treaty of Fez in 1912, which, is, which established the French and Spanish protectorates. Sasha Pack has written about the ways in which the Strait of Gibraltar region as a whole developed as a borderland over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, with Tangier as a critical node in the geographic constellation. The growing inter-imperial tensions of the European powers and their respective interventions into Morocco's economic, financial, and biopolitical affairs, located largely in their center of operations of Tangier, shaped the character of the city in profound ways. This included British and Spanish interventions into Tangier's ports, customs collections, in the wake of the Spanish-Moroccan War, as Morocco struggled to pay Spain a large indemnity. Um, so building from Pax's conceptualization, um, Tangier existed simultaneously as a political border and a civilizational border, um, and borders that were constantly being made and remade. And as a result, it existed at the intersections and overlaps of political and civilizational entities. Struggles for imperial sovereignty over the city and behind it, Morocco, between France, Spain, and Britain, quite literally produced a fractious border zone within the city via customs collections, public health policies, commerce, tourism, and occasionally instances of violent conflict. So turning now back to sound, um, in my analysis of Tangier as a border zone, I'll be drawing on sound studies and the work of a few scholars in particular. As noted in Western travel accounts to Tangier during this period, one of the most readily identifiable tropes is noise and sound. Not content to simply narrate Tangier's visual landscape, travelers emphasize its soundscape and sometimes its smellscape uh, as an attempt to properly convey their overwhelming encounter with the city. Western ocular centrism has historically set up a binary between the visual as something objective and detached and the aural as something immersive and affective. So on the one hand, we can read such aural narratives as subjective wrestlings with what seemed out of control and unruly about Tangier via a recourse to the non-visual senses. Um, yet at the same time, we must also be attentive to Anna Maria Ochoa Gautier's critique of ocular centrism when she states that the aural is not the other of the lettered city but rather a formation that either subverts or upholds its foundations and that the two modes of apprehending are constitutive. Also salient here is Amanda Weidman's contention that representations of music and sound are more than atmospheric detail, but rather can serve as the very ground on which racial difference is established. She writes, the realm of the aural is more than a secondary reflection on social and political dynamics. It is itself a force that has social and political consequences. I think what's also interesting is that to this day, recycled tropes on Tangier, including its chaos and sound, um, regularly appear in Western popular and media representations. In a 2010 Guardian article on Tangier, the journalist wrote, there's something about the noise and mess and energy in these badly paved streets that promises adventure and that conjures up ghosts, which I think is a line that would be at home in any circa 1900 travelogue. <laughs> 
Similarly, American travel expert Rick Steves writes about how roosters and the call to prayer work together to wake me and the rest of that world. Um, also a description that we'll see has at least uh, a century old history and its use of sonic tropes. And perhaps most famously, Anthony Bourdain filmed one of the first episodes of his CNN series, Parts Unknown in Tangier, following in the footsteps of William S. Burroughs and navigating the food and drug culture. And notably towards the end of the episode, he laments the end of the hippie drug era, but adds the good stuff, the real good stuff, the sounds and smells and the look of Tangier, what you see and hear when you look out the window and take it all in, that's here to stay. Um, so the fact that this sound and noise and energy remains so firmly associated with the city uh, to this day means it's especially ripe for historical interrogation. Of course, certain things have changed. While Tangier is still labeled the gateway to Africa for foreign travelers and in tourism ads, um, it is also part of the longer political border that separates Africa from Europe uh, and the EU, which in recent years has become increasingly policed uh, and militarized. The Mediterranean migrant crisis sees thousands of migrants, a large number of whom are from sub-Saharan Africa, attempt to cross the sea in boats. Um, and these attempts claim hundreds of lives every year. Morocco in particular has seen an increase in migrant activity since the mid 2010s, owing in part to the danger and instability in Libya, which was a former favored departure point, um, including in 2017, where there were reports of modern day Libyan slave markets that emerged in which migrants are being bought and sold into slavery. Um, so since then, Morocco has become the favored departure point and Tangier especially due to its close proximity to Spain. At the same time, African migrants in Tangier and Morocco regularly face racism, violence, and threats, uh, both from civilians and from police and security forces, while Spain and the European Union channel funds to Morocco to increase border security. So this iteration of the historic continental border inverts its Western and touristic gaze and renders it instead of the gateway to Africa, the gateway to Europe, or as one journalist poignantly rendered it, the back door to Europe, um, and a door that threatens danger, racism, police violence, and even modern day iterations of slavery. So I think it's important to keep this present situation in mind as we interrogate the historical construction of race, coloniality, and borderness in Tangier, because many of these themes have continued and in some ways even intensified into the present. So with this in mind today, I'll be doing a brief but close reading of a few sources that allow us to begin to key into the resonances of colonial Tangier, um, read through and against the grain of the European encounter with the city. In these accounts, we can hear Tangier's colonization and settlement, its simmering potential as a site of anti-European and anti-Christian resistance, the racializing of its population, as well as the complex ways that Tangier was situated as both a metonym for Morocco and as a realm apart from it. Um, as both a European outpost and an African city, and ultimately as a liminal border zone in which every level of encounter was consequently intensified and imbued with profound meaning. Um, so for kind of organization's sake, I've split the talk into three short sections of three different types of sonic encounter, um, civilizational encounter, racial encounter, and colonial encounter. Um, and so for now, I'll turn first to the civilizational encounter. So these will largely be based on European travelogues to Tangier in this period. Um, and before I start those, I just want to note that in this historical context, European tourism and travel writing, what we can see is not simply uh, literary genres, but actually constitutive elements of the colonization process, um, as Pack has argued. Uh, in many ways, it's impossible to disambiguate between European tourists and settlers in Tangier in this period. For one thing, the transport firms and tour companies that helped build Moroccan tourism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries were at least partly motivated by a desire to promote European settlement in the country um, for economic, if not explicitly imperial purposes. For another, many Europeans existed in a gray zone between tourist and settler in Tangier. Uh, the European consuls registered as residents all who planned to stay in the city for two months or more, which included many winter tourists, and small semi-permanent communities were thus constructed in the city. 
So recognizing that travel writing as a genre is often itself an indirect endorsement of empire in the Tangier context, we can maybe go a step further to conceptualize the various tourists, travelers, and settlers as part of a shared category of European imperial actors. So there are a number of sonic tropes related to Tangier um, that have a history dating to at least the 19th century. For example, in Pierre Loti's famous travelogue, uh, in which he describes the grand market of Tangier as being part of the old Africa at the threshold of our modern civilization, he writes, sounds of, a very raucous, sounds of very raucous human voices and of beasts' growls rise from the confused masses that cover the ground of the place, as well as an Arab musette instrument that begins to moan, dominating all the other noises in its shrill and yelping voice. So here we can already see how references to animal noises and strange instruments were invoked as very loud markers of difference. This was especially so in street scenes, um, travelers often described being deafened or dazed by the noises around them, including the repeated cries of balek by donkey and mule drivers making their way down the streets. The Islamic call to prayer was often frequently invoked. Um, in 1931, Marie Therese Gadala recounted waking up her first morning in Tangier to the song of the muezzin, song of the nightingale, song of the rooster that resembles the song of the muezzin, a donkey that brays, this is Africa. And you may recall that these are the exact sonic markers that Rick Steves indicated in the 2010s. Besides animal noises and sonic markers of Islam, uh, perhaps the most common sonic trope was the noise of the crowd in which the crowd became a metaphor for the confusing mass of humanity that inhabited this threshold of civilization. American traveler E. Burton Holmes described in the Petit Soko, a mass that moves and gives forth cries and odors and elsewhere the ill smelling yelling crowd and declared here is the borderland of the real Africa. Here surges the murky tide of African humanity. Here breaks the last sun crested wave of continental civilization. Here Europe ends and Africa begins. To illustrate this further, he went on to write from the windows of the legation of a European nation, which open upon the Soko, there are wafted lively measures of piano melody, and these are almost drowned by the prayers of beggars, the vociferations of the trading throng, and the incantations of half crazy conjurers. Descriptions of Tangier often rested on this narrative premise of civilizational clash and conflict between worlds. And this demonstrates how sonic and musical phenomena set up the city as a border zone between Africa and Europe. In this telling, the piano stands in for the civilized, which here is associated with the European legations and buildings of the city. Yet even this continued presence of the civilized is ultimately drowned out by the much more powerful sonic phenomenon of the unruly crowd. This yelling crowd often showed up even at the very moment of arrival by boat. Travelers would comment usually with a thrill on the boat stewards who boarded the ship at the dock to take luggage and passengers ashore. One traveler recalled a mass of shouting, screaming, and gesticulating Arabs climbing aboard. Another described how they'd go on rowing and screaming in their strange language. Aside from deafening noises, Pierre Loti also invoked the absence of sound as a marker of civilizational difference, describing the transition from Spain to Tangier as a white shroud that falls, extinguishing the noises of before, stopping all the modern agitations of life such as the railway and the ferry boat that had brought him there. The shroud he claimed was Islam. And as soon as he set foot on land, he had the sensation of traveling back in time where modern technology and its noises no longer existed. As such, Loti proclaimed the impression of arrival in Tangier was more striking than in any of the other African ports of the Mediterranean. So moving on now to the second type of encounter I mentioned, the racial encounter. One phenomenon that I wanted to signal before returning strictly to the realm of sound is racialization um, or more the compulsion to racialize, particularly at the moment of what I call extreme encounter or immediately following the subject's arrival to the city. Um, for example, stepping off of the boat, interacting with customs officials, taking a first walk through the old city streets. The fact that the traveler's arrival in Tangier was often their first contact with Morocco and with Africa produced what seemed like an irresistible impulse to assess and categorize the local population based on the first few faces that they witnessed. 
This moment of extreme encounter is a moment that then produced the richest and paradoxically the most flattening assessments of Moroccan people deeply rooted in racial assumptions. This compulsion to racialize mapped onto broader European curiosity about the Moors um, and also colonial projects that aim to define North African peoples using modern social science. And Tangier easily became a kind of laboratory for the casual observer. Extreme encounter, a striking experience as Loti described above, was heightened by the extremely short travel time between Spain and Africa and compelled visitors to make a study of the Moroccan racial landscape. Amidst descriptions of the diverse mix of peoples, costumes, and languages in the city, there were at the same time efforts to survey and document to make orderly and legible what seemed chaotic and noisy. The aforementioned luggage handlers who climbed aboard the boat at the moment of arrival, as well as the customs officials on the docks were frequent subjects of study in this moment of extreme encounter. Uh, an Austrian traveler commented on the coffee colored skin of the luggage handlers Another compared their agility to monkeys, and French politician Albert Cousin stepped off the boat in 1898 and immediately was struck by the three superb Arabs who asked if you have anything to declare. Cousin claimed that based on these three men, you could make, quote, your first study of Moroccan customs. You look closely at these beautiful Arabs and you are struck by the whiteness and the delicateness of their complexion, by the delicacy of their well-groomed hands. Cousin's impression of Arab whiteness here can be situated within a broader French impulse to locate whiteness in North Africa, albeit an often ambivalent whiteness that variously encompassed Arab and Berber racial identity and was implicitly positioned against a black Africanness. What's interesting is that the same impulse was present in more formal studies of race in North Africa. In 1903, the anthropologist Adolf Bloch presented a study on Tangier at the Society of Anthropology in Paris, in which he attempted to uncover the racial origins of the Moors, or all North Africans, based on what appears to have been a very short excursion to Tangier. His choice of Tangier as a racial laboratory for North Africa was partly based on convenience. He was already in Spain at the time for the International Congress of Medicine, and partly based on the belief that Morocco was a better site of study than Algeria or Tunisia, because Morocco had not yet been formally colonized and thus the Moors were still masters of the country. Bloch's first impression upon his arrival by boat to Tangier was the diversity, which continued as he made his way to the heart of the old city. Quote, there were types of all colors, white, brown, and black, and diversity in the coloration of the skin. Bloch made detailed observations on the physical traits he observed amongst the Tangier inhabitants skin colors, hair types, facial features, head shapes, and from these drew his hypotheses about Moroccan's racial origins. In particular, Bloch was fascinated by the question of Moroccan blackness. He cited a Moroccan guide who insisted that there were only two races in Morocco, a white race and a black race, and the white race, quote, equally includes black Moroccans, meaning here dark-skinned Moroccans, while the black race was entirely populations who came from Sudan or Sub-Saharan Africa. The guide also supported Bloch's theory that some effect of climate or environment darkened the skin of black Moroccans. Introducing him to a friend of his who was according to Bloch almost black, the guide claimed, here's a young man who was all white when I knew him as a child. So based on this interlocutor and his very short time in Tangier, Bloch concluded that the Moors were neither Arab nor black but were rather the result of mixing of races while ultimately being a particular race of Berbers or Imazigan who had formed from the transformation of a black race. Bloch's conclusions are remarkable, first because he presumed that Tangier was a reliable laboratory within which to study the race science of all Moroccans despite its reputation for diversity and foreign settlement. But perhaps more remarkable are Bloch's confused conclusions regarding the Arab, Amazigh, and Black racial makeup of Moroccans. With the advent of the French protectorate a few years later, official colonial scholarship would similarly grapple with this racial question, but tended to downplay Black identity and populations in Morocco and focus almost entirely on the question of Arabs and Berbers. It was not politically useful for French authorities to engage with the Blackness or Africanness of Morocco, and so few accounts of the era do. While Bloch's anthropology is racial pseudoscience and essentially anecdotal, his focus on Black Moroccans in Tangier would become more uncommon with official colonial scholarship. 
Um, at the same time, it also underscores the ambivalent Africanness that Tangier and Morocco represented in the European imagination. This is especially the case when we set it against the backdrop of discourses of Tangier as the gateway to Africa, where Africa was often but not always associated with blackness. Remarks about the tide of African humanity and the beginning of the real Africa, as mentioned earlier, collapsed Tangier and indeed all of Morocco into a monolithic other that was contained in the concept of Africa, a place that was at once continental and civilizational, African and Oriental, Black and Arab and Muslim. The presence of Africa in Tangier was perhaps most forcefully visually signaled to Western visitors as for Bloch by so-called Black faces and also in sound by Black musicians. In the early 1900s, one figure that caught the attention of many Europeans for this reason was the Black Ganawi street performer. So one such European was Casimir Blanc, a musical educator who settled in Tangier. In 1908, Blanc published a booklet on Moorish music that was meant to be a comprehensive introduction to music in Morocco. He dedicated one chapter, the last in the booklet, to a Ganawi musician named Chicago as a representative of Black Moroccan music entitled Player of the Krakeb or the Ganawi. The rest of the book had primarily focused on Andalusian music and orchestral music. However, this final chapter was written as more of an entertaining anecdote and less serious than the previous chapters, uh, perhaps here belying French attitudes towards the legitimacy of Ganawa music, which Blanc referred to here as Sudanese music. According to Blanc, the man called himself Chicago because he claimed to have visited the 1893 Columbian Exposition and sang and danced for tips from Europeans. Blanc asked, who of us Tangier residents have not seen him on the Grand or Petit Soco or in front of the terraces of our great cafes and hotels? While Blanc's visual descriptions of Chicago are blatantly racist, his sonic descriptions are not much better as when he writes, Quote, he accompanies his dances with a kind of muffled squeak that is not human, and that seems to come at the same time from the stomach, the nose, and the mouth of the musician. When he sees ladies on the balconies, Blanc writes, he sings in a hollow voice his song about going to Chicago and seeing America. And when local children harass him and pull on his jalaba, he, quote, terrorizes them with his booming voice, as if Jupiter made Mount Olympus tremble. Blanc's caricature of the Ganawi street musician is largely premised on these othering sonic markers, from squeaking to booming to a hollow voice singing a grifter's song. Blanc does not take him seriously as a musician. Instead, his inclusion here was more a nod to a familiar splash of local color, uh, yet one that simultaneously glimpsed the exotic and the African, and other even within the Moroccan landscape. Ganawa was also simply an addendum to his text on the more serious forms of Moroccan music. Uh, so despite this being an, a scholarly study in earnest um, of music by a settled resident, Blanc's work also strongly echoed Western travelogues. E. Burton Holmes, the American travel writer, described a figure that also may have been Chicago or simply one of his fellow street musicians. In the same year as Blanc's booklet was published, 1908, Burton Holmes made his journey to Tangier. As mentioned earlier, he was struck by the mingling of the Occidental and the Oriental and of Europe and Africa. Shortly after his arrival, he visited a cafe in the Petit Soco and he and his companions watched the performance of a black street performer, according to Burton Holmes from the Southern Seuss province. Burton Holmes described him as having a quote, wig of wool hung with shells and teeth and nails, all of which clatter as he dances to the music of a pair of iron castanets. Like Blanc, his description of the performer is racist, comparing him both visually and sonically to an ape. Yet, unlike Blanc, he provides photographs in which two of his party pose for two separate photos with the man. Both photos betray Burton Holmes' racist and exoticizing lens. Um, visually, they intervene on his description by clearly showing us the man's deliberate standing pose paired with a direct yet relaxed gaze at the camera uh, which seemed to show uh, his awareness of the visual conventions of a tourist photo, as well as a savvy and intentional performance. 
Unfortunately, we do not have a sonic equivalent of this photograph that can equally disrupt the racial caricature of Burton Holmes' description, but we might be able to imagine it. It suffices here, however, to observe that in taking and printing these photographs uh, and making these descriptions, he saw an opportunity to collect his own specimen of Africa in the streets of Morocco, who like Blanc, he perceived as both belonging and not belonging to the already exotic setting. So it's worth noting here that even in such accounts narrated racial difference along a black white binary, the racial situation in Morocco was complicated and generally escaped, significant, uh, generally escaped simplistic European understandings. Black populations had inhabited Morocco for centuries and there was significant stratification in class and status and diversity that also shifted across the geography. Blackness often continued to be associated with slavery uh, at the same time, slavery in Morocco was undergoing a transition period. The trans-Saharan slave trade ended in the early 20th century, uh, and many public slave markets were closed in major, Europe, or major Moroccan cities, partly due to European pressure. However, slave markets continued to operate, often covertly, at least into the 1920s in cities like Fez and Marrakesh. Indeed, Burton Holmes describes happening upon one in the dead of night while visiting Fez. Meanwhile, over the course of the French protectorate, a large migration of black Moroccans, namely the Haratine and populations from Southern Morocco's anti-Atlas and Saharan borderlands, moved northward to the economic centers of the country, such as Casablanca and Rabat. While some European abolitionist, abolitionist campaigns set their sights on Morocco, the French colonial attitude towards slavery was often complacent. Rita Ouad has written about how the early French protectorate, following Lyotet's Politique Musulman, largely divested itself of the slavery issue, claiming it must end through custom and not law. On the ground, this attitude was often even more permissive. Uh, in his book on Tangier, French colonial council member Albert Cousin not only denounced anti-slavery crusades as misplaced and even unjust, as Moroccan slavery was gentle in comparison to elsewhere, he even provided information on the typical price for black slaves in the city, raising the question of what he thought his French readership would do with this information. Revealing his racial prejudices, he also accepted black slavery and seemed to imply erroneously that all black peoples in Morocco were slaves from the Sudan, while decrying the capture and sale of brunette mountain girls who were not suited for such a life. Evidently for him, the white slavery of Arabs and Berbers was immoral by contrast. Meanwhile, the Ganawa were a black Sufi brotherhood with historical ties to the trans-Saharan slave trade that largely existed on the margins of Moroccan uh, society throughout this period. Um, specifically, Ganawa music merited only a few passing mentions in French colonial musicology. Alexis Chotin, the most prominent and prolific musicologist to protector at Morocco, allotted only one paragraph to the Ganawa in his comprehensive Tableau de la Musique Marocaine, which otherwise was split into an Arab and a Berber section. Elsewhere, in a talk turned article on the faces of Moroccan music, Chotin referred to the Ganawa only as a point of comparison to another genre, a musical fanfare performed for the Saint Moulay Idris. Chotin says in a tongue-in-cheek manner, do not tell these fanfarists that their manner of honoring their patron saint resembles at all that of the Ganawas, that ridiculous brotherhood of Blacks. These limited and dismissive and condescending references to the Ganawa broadly represent the wider French attitude towards them, both as producers of legitimate music and as people, um, and in many ways echoing the French attitude towards black populations in Morocco. So instead, Ganawi most often made appearances in popular travelogues, um, like the ones mentioned above. As such, European sonic encounters with Ganawi musicians can be read as more than simple curiosity, but as exoticizing and often racist attempts to grapple with the Africa they believed they were encountering, as well as the confounding racial landscape of Morocco. And it's worth mentioning here, since I brought up Chotin, that almost all of his work was structured um, in this so-called Arab-Berber racial paradigm, which was the standard for the French protectorate. Um, as you can see in the table of contents for his tableau, it was split into one Berber section and one Arab section, um, or this program for a concert, which uh, his article, The Faces of Moroccan Music was the preface for, um, was split into Berber music and urban music, urban music usually mapping roughly onto Arab music. 
Um, so this was the frequent paradigm, um, which Ganawa and other more marginal musics uh, barely fit into. Um, and that's something I can talk about more in the Q&A uh, if anyone is interested. So now turning to the last type of encounter that I mentioned, the colonial encounter. So while the Treaty of Fez um, wasn't signed until 1912, there had been creeping European settlement of Tangier for decades prior, as mentioned. Diplomats, merchants, itinerant laborers, and political refugees gradually poured into Tangier over the second half of the 19th century, with an even greater influx of European migrants following the Anglo-French Treaty in 1904. Thus, the period from the 1890s to 1912 was a time of growing European domination and colonial ambitions in which Tangier was seen as the gateway. As a result, the textual and sonic encounters in this two decade period were especially fraught. Travelogues, informational booklets, and official reports revolved directly or indirectly around this question of expected eventual colonization and mastery of the country. So Tangier had 40,000, roughly 40,000 residents in 1904. Uh, and while like most of Morocco, it was a predominantly Muslim city, roughly a quarter to a third of Tangier's residents were Jews. Susan Miller has written about the unique situation of Tangier's Jews. Unlike in other cities, there was no walled off Mela or Jewish quarter. And rather, Jews lived amongst and intermingled with Muslims and Europeans while also running their own separate religious and administrative affairs. As she describes, this religious life centered on the street of the synagogues in the Medina's Beni Eder quarter, where the melodies floated out into the street and the quarter would awash with the sounds of collective devotion. While Muslim Jewish relations could be fraught in Morocco, the story in Tangier was thus slightly different. The lack of physical walls was both evidence and engine of the greater integration of Tangier's Jews with the broader city life and the web of relationships with their Muslim neighbors. However, periods of Muslim Jewish tensions and anti-Jewish violence did occur in Tangier as elsewhere. For example, in 1863, the Ben Yehuda affair in Safi, in which a teenage Jewish servant and a Jewish British protege were accused of killing a Spanish customs agent. Under the Spanish minister, they were tortured into confessing and the Sultan ordered them executed. The British protege Lalouche, despite being from Safi, was executed in Tangier to maximize the audience and reach of the warning. An uneasy period of intercommunal tensions followed this incident in Tangier and elsewhere. As Sasha Pack has demonstrated, such episodes of violence were intimately tied up even at this early point with inter-imperial ambitions and rivalries, yet they still show the ways in which even in Tangier, the Jewish, Jewish position was not always secure. And especially in this period, there were growing suspicions about loyalties to the Sultan versus collaboration with the encroaching foreign powers. So here I want to end with a story that takes place at the very moment of the official imposition of European colonialism in Morocco in 1912. So this sonic colonial encounter has as its backdrop Tangier's unique ethnic situation, as well as the broader inter-ethnic and inter-religious divisions that were often exacerbated by European intervention. It also shows the ways in which anti-colonial anxieties and colonial repression and violence could be sounded or at least imagined as being sounded in Tangier's cityscape. So in 1912, the French writer Eugène Montfort visited Tangier and heard evidence of anti-French Muslim Jewish cooperation that spurred a strong emotional response. In an article published in both the Echo de Paris and Le Journal du Maroc, Montfort describes his arrival in Tangier as surprisingly pleasant in his moment of extreme encounter, he found the locals to be nonchalant, indifferent, and peaceful in their attitude towards him. This immediately put him at ease as he strolled Tangier's labyrinth of streets. That evening, he visited a local cafe where Jewish women singers performed. Like many Europeans, he stressed the alienness of the sounds they made. They sang, quote, in a very high tone, forcing their voices to the point of making protrude all the veins on their forehead, temples, and neck and accompanied by ancient instruments with nasal sounds. He noticed that the Moroccans seated around him paid special attention to one of the songs, and he asked his interpreter what the words meant. The interpreter appeared troubled and insisted that it was not interesting and refused to translate. 
The next evening, Montfort visited a different cafe with a different interpreter and a different Jewish woman singer. And he was struck when she sang the exact same song from the previous night. He asked his new interpreter what it meant. And this man replied, it is a lament about the massacre by the French of a marabou or a Muslim holy man in Casablanca. Immediately, Montfort details how he was plunged into a sense of doubt and anxiety about these Arabs. He begins to recount how in Islamic countries, the oral transmission of song and poetry was often used as a means of propaganda. And he remarked, this people that seems so indolent and so impassive has ears of incredible finesse. He claimed that when the Sultan wanted to spread a piece of information, for example, he published a piece of verse in the Parisian press so that all of his subjects could read it as a kind of political code. He wrote, I do not doubt the influence on Moroccan hearts of the lament that I had heard sung in the cafes of Tangier. He no longer believed in the tranquility and indifference of the Arabs he passed in the street for what could they be telling in their gibberish and what hatred of the invader, what impatience of the yoke were their measured and discreet words hiding. For him, the seeds of revolt were invisible and were spreading silently, only making themselves known to Europeans like himself when they were sounded in oral propaganda like the Jewish woman's song. As such, Montfort advocated in the conclusion to his article that the French must take action and forcefully demonstrate their moral and physical superiority to the Moroccans. With this and sustained from time to time by the noise of cannons in the distance, one convinces the natives little by little one is respected by them, he wrote. So Montfort's dramatic account here is a wash in meaningful noise from the subtly rebellious nasal tones of the Jewish women's song to the quiet gibberish that Moroccans were passing through the streets with the threatening noise of cannons that he advocated to counter both of the former and that the French would use to maintain their recently won colony. That the song also indicated collaboration across both religious and spatial lines, Jews and Muslims, Tangier and Casablanca, no doubt increased the perceived threat that alarmed Montfort. So here's just one example that I wanted to highlight of how music and sound in the city streets could simultaneously express resistance, signal threats, and fuel colonial, uh, violent colonial repression. The soundscape of Tangier was never a neutral site, but one upon which colonial and racial anxieties were inscribed and which was then generative itself of new anxieties. As I argue, following Ochoa Gautier and Weidman, sound was never merely reflective, but was itself constitutive of the colonial and racial encounter. And Tangier in the early 20th century is a particularly rich example of how this could be affected in no small part due to its unique position as the border of Europe and Africa as well as in this period being at the precipice of colonial domination. Uh, the above examples overall, I think show how sound sets up race and racial categories, props up or subverts colonial authority and animates imagined geographies that have real world political and diplomatic implications. Tangier's borderness is not just an effect of its geological positioning on the Strait of Gibraltar, but rather a much more nuanced and multi-tiered construct that takes account of race, sovereignty, language, music, and is both constituted by and productive of sound and noise and energy. In particular, its Africanness has been ambivalently engaged with uh, in both European and Moroccan accounts. Um, and with this study, I hope to begin to move towards apprehending the city of Tangier as more than a border zone, but rather as a global city. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Liz. That was a fascinating paper uh, that I'm sure is going to lead to a very uh, producing, um, productive and stimulating uh, conversation. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone of the etiquette for making questions. So if you can, please post your question on the chat or say on the chat that you want to make a question. Uh, do not use the raise hand facility, so in that way I can keep uh, track of the order in which questions are made. Uh, we actually have two questions. We have a question in the chat and then a, uh, a request to make a question. Uh, so Matthew, uh, who um, has had to leave or is going to leave soon, asks, um, thanks for a fabulous talk, Liz. I wondered whether your PhD research considers 
at all the Franco regime's occupation of Tangier between 1940 and 45. Uh, recent scholarship, uh, Eric, Samuel, that's me, I guess, gives us an understanding of musical life in the Spanish protectorate and above all in Tetuan, particularly in terms of the focus on Andalusian music. But what changes, if any, occurred during this period to the soundscapes of Tangier? In what, way, in what ways did the regime seek to adapt, control musical and sonic life? And um, with that, he's stolen my own question. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, so obviously with this talk, I really focused more on the um, earlier period from, you know, kind of the years leading up to and immediately following the imposition of the French and Spanish protectorates in 1912, um, which I think is like kind of a special period in its own way and characterized by a very unique uh, kind of political and sonic moment. Um, so obviously I didn't get to get to the later colonial period, the international zone or the Spanish occupation uh, but I do think that that is a really interesting point, um, and this is something I hope to pursue more with this project. Um, in my dissertation, uh, I do focus on that period, although it's more focused on the French protectorate um, kind of colonial projects in uh, music and musicology, um, and not as much on the Spanish, but I am very interested in it, um, and I am, you know, also very indebted to the work of both Eric and Samuel um, on this topic. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that I hope to pursue more with this project moving forward as I move into that period. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a request for a question by Steve Wilford. So Steve, if you could please unmute yourself. Sure, thank you, Samuel. Um, thank you, Liz, for a fantastic talk. Um, I've just asked to ask a question over video and my two daughters are downstairs screaming, so I apologize if you can't hear what I'm saying. Um, but I was, it was a really, really wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wondered, sort of following on in a way from Matthew's question, as, as sort of time develops over the first half of the 20th century, and presumably Tangier, like lots of other places in North Africa, start to see the impact of industrialism and capitalism and those sorts of things, new technologies arriving, that might start to change the soundscape of, of the city. How does that fit into European, and particularly French, sort of notions of exoticism and Orientalism? Um, I know in my own work on Algeria, that's, that's something that I'm kind of interested in, this, this kind of the, the way that the, the French authorities and French society struggle to kind of match up this imagined exoticized world that they have with the realities of sort of industrial sounds suddenly appearing in these, these sorts of soundscapes. So I wondered if you could say a little bit about that perhaps. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really fascinating point. Um, and yeah, I do think that, you know, there is a way that absolutely that would change the apprehension of Tangier as a city and as a kind of civilizational, you know, node um, as kind of modernity and the sounds of modernity uh, make their appearance in the city increasingly. Obviously that completely disrupts this earlier narrative. For example, Lotiv had about, you know, the silence uh, the silencing of modernity, the silencing of technology when he arrived in Tangier. Um, but on the other hand, I think there's a way that those types of discourses can just be kind of reshaped and reformed into new packages. So like, for example, I, I very briefly referred to this, but I feel like so many of these tropes are still present to this day um, in, in Tangier, you know, both popularly and scholarly. Um, kind of trope, sonic tropes of Tangier have persisted even into this very modern period. So I wonder about the ways that, um, you know, the kind of noisy cityscape can just be adapted to a new type of noise with the advent of cars and, you know, railways and, and um, you know, in the industrialized city. Um, it's not something I, I thought about a lot, but I think that's a really interesting point. And I think that my initial answer would just be to say, I think it changes uh, a lot of things, but the kind of content can be reshaped to still figure into those, the, the, the overall discourse of the exotic city and the other and the civilizational kind of threshold, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. Um, just just quickly, um, I don't know if you've come across the work of Rebecca Scales in Algeria on kind of public listening. Um, it's called, it's something to do with radio. She's got a couple of journal articles. One of them's about sort of transnational radio or something. 
um, and she's talking about sort of French colonial fears of sound in in cafes and those sorts of spaces and sort of collective listening practices. Um, so you might want to maybe have a look at that. It's really interesting. But thanks again, Lily. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much for the question. Uh, we have next in line a question from Eric Calderwood. Would you like to unmute yourself, Eric? I'm nice to meet you, by the way. Hey, nice to meet you as well. Am I am I on? <laughs> yes. Good. Excellent. Uh, Liz, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. It's just really, really interesting topic. Uh, I had two sort of open-ended questions, and uh, hopefully you have some thoughts about both of them, but if not, you can just ignore one or both of them. Uh, the first of them is, uh, the first question is about the word Africa. Um, I had in my kind of bouncing around in my mind, this idea that Africa in Spanish often is, often just means Morocco. Uh, or Morocco is a kind of synecdoche for, for Africa. The kind of most famous example of this would be the War of Africa, which is what the Spanish name for the Spanish-Moroccan War. And, you know, you don't have to do much with the Spanish word, but but it, it, it this kind of reminded me of the mutability of what Africa means, what geographies and peoples and cultures are evoked by it. So I guess I was wondering to, I was, I was hoping you could talk a bit more about how we can use sound as a way of tracking the shifting meanings of Africa, at least the shifting meanings in the European imagination and how like sun, sound is one measure uh, of, of that kind of uh, something to measure that, the meaning. Uh, the other thing, the other question I had had to do with language as a form of sound. Um, something that I've come across a lot uh, in a little bit later, but kind of European travel 20s and 30s is, this feeling of Tanger being a place where the streets are filled with all these different languages, the kind of Tower of Babel. Um, and this reminded me of the moment in your talk when uh, one of the European travelers refers to the Arabic as gibberish. Uh, and not to like bring the Spanish in again, but like the, the Spanish word for gibberish is actually etymologically connected to Arabic. Algarabia is, is, is a kind of Spanish word that etymologically just means Arabic. And so it made me think about how would you fit in language and particularly multilingualism into a form of sound and differentiating between languages that are meaningful noise versus other languages that are noise without meaning. Um, and so anyway, those, those are two, two questions I, I had while listening to the talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think these are great questions. Um, I will try to answer both of them. <laughs> uh, so, so Africa, um, this, you know, the concept of Africa, I think it's really interesting that, yeah, I, I totally see what you're saying about how it can be a synecdoche or metonym for just uh, all, Morocco can be that uh, to the Spanish um, as, as kind of a metonym for Africa. Um, I wonder, you know, I mean, one of the things about the concept of Africa, and of course, you know, coming at it not from the Spanish context, but I, I think it's just so, like I said at the beginning, the talk such a mutable concept, um, so completely imagined and and just constantly being constructed or reconstructed according to the political and cultural context. Um, so I think, you know, I'd be interested to know more about uh, how persistent that use of Africa for Morocco is in Spanish discourse um, and writings uh, and kind of popular imagery um, over time, right? Like, you know, is it, has it continued to be that to this day or is it now, has that disappeared? Uh, but, but more generally, I think that's the whole problem with the term is that it just means something different all the time. So for example, like when people would come into Tangier, often they would be calling it Africa you know, because it's such a moment of arrival to be setting foot on African soil. Um, but then they would leave and they might go on their little trek to Fez or, you know, their their tour into the countryside and they would come back and they'd be like, now we're in Europe, you know, being back in Tangier is like, now I'm back in Europe and I'm back in Western civilization. So Africa suddenly disappears from Tangier then. So, it, I mean, just what I'm fascinated by is the kind of the construct of it I think what you brought up is another example of that um, and how it can shift over time. But yeah, and, and sonically, definitely, that's why I was interested particularly in musical genres that were perceived as being African in the Tangier landscape, I think was one of the most obvious ways that that 
was signaled, but it's much, I think it's much more complicated when all of Tangier becomes perceived as Africa, um, which I kind of tried to tease out in my talk a bit. Um, and then in terms of language, I guess related to that is, yeah, I, the, the trope of language did come up frequently, um, the gibberish comment, and then also just this talk about these diverse, this diversity of languages that's heard in the streets. Um, also comments about, you know, the kind of hybrid languages that some of the uh, residents or semi-settled residents of Tangier would speak. That was between uh, Spanish and Rifian and, um, and, and Arabic. Um, so that, I think the way language that I've noticed language figures into it is just mostly in the kind of confusingness of it and the diversity uh, because Tangier has so many languages that are being spoken, some of them even by the same person within the same sentence, you know. Um, but but I do think that at least in the context I I'm talking about, the Western perception of language really ascribed the kind of gibberish idea more to, you know, Arabic and the, the native languages that they were hearing um, because they were so unintelligible. So I think the unintelligibility um, really factored more into this kind of civilizational racial uh, encounter more than anything. But I think it'd be interesting to look even more closely at what uh, the more uh, how those languages were disambiguated, um, maybe in different neighborhoods and amongst different like classes. Um, but yeah, no, but thank you for those comments. I think those are really interesting things to think about. Okay, Thanks thank so much. you very much, Sarah, for your question. Um, so the next question is by Beth Ann. She is asking to make a question. Could you please unmute yourself? Yeah, hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Liz, good to see you. Hi. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Um, and in fact, the range of questions being asked, I think, is a great testament to how rich and great the talk and the research is, because mine are totally different, although I love the two that you just answered as well. Um, so the first is if you have any thoughts or things to add about the role of religion in these landscapes. So you mentioned briefly the call to prayer and then later in terms of relationship to the Jewish community, you talked a little bit about the music. I was just curious to hear how that layer also comes in and thinking about these questions of civilization, racialization, difference, et cetera. Um, and then the second is I wonder how much, especially as you're um, sort of moving more into questions about sound and the landscape, how much you get into questions of affect and the kind of um, feelings and like sensory experiences that colonial and other people are trying to capture and express. Um, if you're kind of questioning or trying to get into that with your work and what that looks like. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Those are great questions. Um, so yeah, the role of religion, I think that's a huge part of these soundscapes. Um, and I think it's a, it's, you know, a, a conscious uh, apprehension on the part of many of these visitors. They're very hyper aware of religion because there's this religious difference. There's this sense of like entering the realm of Islam and of uh, being in a Muslim city for the first time perhaps. Um, so I think the call to prayer coming up so frequently uh, in, accounts of Tangier uh, really testifies to that um, in the sense that the call to prayer and the kind of Islamic sounds were very obvious markers of difference. Uh, and, but I think that, you know, I think that there's, there, there were also some accounts that talked about the kind of diversity of religion, kind of going back to the language question a little bit is that you know, Tangier was also characterized by its diversity, by its kind of confusing mix of different things happening at once. So there would also be references to church bells um, alongside call to prayer, you know, and this kind of clash of civilizations or uh, maybe not clash, but like coexistence of civilizations even um, was something that people really latched on to. Um, but yeah, but I think at least in this talk, I guess I focused a little bit more on the kind of ethnic implications of religion um, for example, with the, with the Jewish community in Tangier and how they uh, factored into the landscape. Um, 
but yeah, I, I absolutely think it's a huge part of all of these encounters. Um, and then in terms of affect, uh, I think that's an interesting point. That's not something I've looked at as much uh, yet because I've kind of been reading these accounts for their sonic qualities, um, but I haven't been disambiguating them so much based on the kind of different affective experiences these people were having, but I definitely have perceived that as I've been going through them. Like some people were like, you know, some people were like really um, thrilled to be coming into Tangier, felt very positively about it, you know, or like enamored of it, romantic kind of uh, visions of the city and uh, of the, the sounds they were encountering. Others were clearly kind of terrified <laughs> or felt very uncomfortable uh, being in this place. And the encounter was entirely different. It was, um, you know, a jarring and uh, the sounds really represented something that made them, you know, uh, uncomfortable. So, um, so I think that's something as I develop this project more, I want to um, kind of lay out more clearly, but for the purposes of this talk, that wasn't something I was kind of separating out, if that makes sense. So thank you for your questions. Um, thanks very much for that question. Um, so the next uh, question is by Vanessa. I don't know, uh, she's posted the question. Would you like to, would you like me to read it out, Vanessa, or perhaps would you like to make the question yourself? If you could pick it up, that would be great, yes. Yep. Uh, so I'd like to, says Vanessa, I'd like to ask a question regarding the appearance of Jewish voices of the of women in the cafes, uh, singing a song about what I assume is a Muslim marabout, parsing that up against the other Jewish sounds which were coming from the synagogues and were masculine. Can you say something about the positioning of women and minorities in the sonic resistance to colonialism? Very interesting question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, obviously the situation of the Jewish women singers in the cafes um, was very singular, um, you know, and it's it's a little bit hard because right as of right now, this is something I hope when I resume research, I can look more into from different source bases. But as of right now, I'm working with these sources that are these very biased European accounts coming in, not necessarily knowing a lot about the landscape and trying to read them against the grain. Um, so I don't have really direct access to who these women were um, and what their situation was. Um, and even if the information about them is 100% accurate. Um, but I think that what's interesting is, um, you know, the role of women who sang in cafes was usually, um, usually were perceived to be of a particular class and status in society. Um, obviously, huge departure from the kind of more solemn and devotional sounds that were coming from the uh, the, the street of the synagogues, uh, very different type of music. Um, I think it's interesting that the role of these women as cafe singers potentially allowed them though to be part of a uh, more subversive project um, in which they were potentially forming bonds across religious lines um, as a result of their role uh, as performers in a kind of a public setting. Um, and then potentially, again, reading it through Montfort's biased account, but potentially then also being part of a larger network um, that was anti-colonial. Um, so yeah, so I think it's really fascinating. Obviously, gender and class uh, and sexuality play into their um, their positioning in this story. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that it's something that when I continue the research on this project, which hopefully will be once the pandemic ends, um, I, uh, I'll be able to access some sources that, that go more into that kind of landscape beyond just this like very biased French account. Okay, thanks for that question, Vanessa. Um, I have a couple of questions, and uh, I think you've talked very well about uh, the different ways in which Tangier is a border, and it's sounded as a border. And uh, you've talked also about sound being a marker of race within Tangier. Um, I'm trying to think of a question that is very closely related to that, but more related to the question of territoriality within Tangier. Um, so I'm um, thinking here 
of uh, well, I'm thinking of the segregation of the city, and I don't know that I have to confess that I'm more familiar with this one. I've been doing more work on this one than on Tangier. Uh, but uh, you've already said that the Melas was not walled, as opposed to other what was going on in other Moroccan cities. But I was wondering to what extent was uh, sound control, either through legislation or whether you've come across any testimonies in literature in any form uh, referring to this segregation and this sound, this sonic dimension of uh, segregation. Uh, whether some areas of the city could have maybe been uh, sonically sanitized, if that makes any sense, uh, perhaps the ensanche. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit about that. And my other question relates to um, to Chotin. Um, I've, I've, you described uh, Tangier as a labor laboratory uh, to um, you know, observe uh, the population and, and draw conclusions about race and, and sort of more than draw conclusions really to test European modern science, uh, social sciences, and their sort of, uh, I don't know if, how to describe it, through the scientific discourse about race. And uh, I was wondering, uh, I mean, when you read Chotin, it seems like uh, you get the impression that uh, direct observation and uh, scholarship went in completely and remotely opposite directions. Uh, then you read Garcia Barriuso and he talks about the Arabs and the Berbers not being uh, distinct in any way. They, uh, he talks about after, after the, um, the Berbers were converted to Islamism in the seventh century, then uh, they were one and the same race and they have a, a, a same art and music. And so it, 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 it seems to me that uh, French policy and Spanish policy were uh, above uh, any any sort of direct observation, and also I suppose the, the weight of travelers, as you showed as well. Now it's there seems to be a it's more like a self-referential discourse, isn't it? So um, I don't know. It, it seems to me that this idea of laboratory is extremely interesting, and and it's kind of ironic then to see that that scholarship seems to be following a completely different direction. So if you wanted to comment to comment a little bit further on that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. Um, well, to your first point about the border uh, within the city or kind of the segregation and sonic segregation, um, you know, I think what, from what I understand about this moment um, in Tangier's history, um, you know, it had developed differently than other Moroccan cities uh, in terms of the fact, first of all, that it had this exponential growth over the course of the 19th century, that they had this influx of European um, uh, European settlement to the point that many parts of it were transformed to be almost European. Um, and then that there was this large influx of migrants and laborers um, that kind of built and settled in new parts of the city over this period. Um, so I think, you know, most of the accounts that I talked about really focused on the Medina uh, and the area around, you know, what, what was referred to as the old city. Um, often this was the most interesting place for travelers because it was the most authentic and the most, you know, most what they expected to find coming to Morocco, finding the, you know, oriental city. Um, but I think, you know, there is definitely a shift when they step out of those areas into the more, uh, the more new parts of the city. Um, you know, also when we see them leaving the city to go either to uh, to some kind of fancy European legation party or to go uh, to leave on one of their tours that goes into the countryside, the surrounding countryside or to go camping. Um, so I definitely think there's a definite spatial element within the city where the sonic landscape shifts dramatically between different neighborhoods. At the same time, as you mentioned, uh, it was also just emphasized the kind of confluence of all these things in one space was another major part of the discourse. So wherever they were in the city, I think that was still one of the most um, the most dominating uh, sonic kind of observations, um, but exacerbated by the fact that there was a lot of mixing of different elements um, in the old city where they usually were. Um, then in terms of Chotin uh, and Garcia Barriuso and uh, musicology, um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's really interesting how 
one of the things I've noticed, and I mostly work with Chotin, although I've read Garcia Barrios's work as well, um, is the ways in which, you know, he was really embedded in Moroccan society um, or in Morocco. He lived there most of his life. Um, he was a school teacher for Muslim students. Um, and he actually was born in Algeria, so he was from North Africa to begin with. Um, but, uh, and, and actually made like really serious, earnest and very detailed studies of these musics um, that, you know, have validity to them in terms of like the, the, the information he was actually gathering. At the same time, at a more meta level, they were still absolutely fitting into this discourse, this useful political, racial French colonial discourse um, about the Moroccan population in which the French protectorate obviously was invested in the Arab Berber paradigm, uh, while the Spanish protectorate was much more interested in emphasizing Hispano Muslim culture and kind of the shared, uh, the shared heritage of Spain and, um, and, and Morocco, focusing on Andalusian music um, and with less attention to Berbers as a separate race. Um, so, so yeah, so I think that it is a self-referential discourse and the interesting thing about musicology, which I talk more about in my dissertation is the way that even the most valid information is put into these kind of categories um, and reproduces and, and uh, reinforces these pre-existing ideas about Morocco's racial situation. Um, and then again, and in that way is then it doesn't, it actually doesn't differ that much from like the casual observers who are coming in with these like preconceived notions um, gathered either from popular or scholarly texts. So yeah, so I think it's very interesting, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much, Liz, uh, for that answer. Uh, we may have time for one or two more questions. Uh, I'm skimming through, you have a lot of accolades. Uh, yeah, we have a question from uh, Barbara Lebrun. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself, Barbara? Hi, good, good evening, Liz. It's in the evening where I am. I'm a colleague of, of Samuel at the University of Manchester in the French Studies Department. Um, uh, that, 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 was, that was really great. And, and good luck with your, um, what we call the Viva, uh, later on this year, from, from what I can understand. I, I was wondering if you can read Arabic and have you been, or translations of Arabic, and have you been accessing um, evaluations of Tangier from Moroccan writers and how they feel that their soundscape has changed with colonial presence. And does that give perhaps a less confrontational uh, sense of, of the place um, as, a, as, a, as a situation for, for mixing, for hybridity, for more perhaps positive readings of musical encounters? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I so I do read Arabic, um, and that is part of my project um, is looking at these uh, accounts from the other side and kind of like putting in conversation the colonial and the uh, you know the colonized view, I guess, um, in the same frame. Uh, however, yeah, in terms of this project, I haven't looked at a lot of Arabic sources for this um, topic, mostly because my intent today was really to. Uh, focus on the colonial view, the Eurocentric view, and just deconstruct it um, for like it's, it's, you know, the civilizational, racial, and colonial discourses um, and the kind of harmful effects that those have had. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, the next step in the project is to, uh, to look more at sources that come from within Tangier and broader Morocco about Tangier from the side of, uh, from Arabic sources. Um, and I am, one thing I can say about, you know, the perception of Tangier in this period and also beyond um, was it wasn't always perceived as a holy Moroccan city um, by Moroccans, uh, especially over this period of European settlement. Uh, it really became seen as a city of foreigners, a city of infidels even, and just like the fact that um, Europeans had really taken over it to such an extent, especially by the early 20th century, um, but it wasn't always claimed as being wholly Moroccan. And that kind of stigma has lasted to the present day in many ways, um, or at least to recent decades, uh, that Tangier isn't wholly a Moroccan city. So I think that that, you know, that would definitely inform uh, the, you know, the textual encounters that would come up uh, during this period. Um, 
but yeah, but I haven't really looked at those sources yet. So that's kind of the next step on my project. But I, I appreciate you bringing it up because I think that's a really important component of, you know, really apprehending the entire encounter as it was occurring in this very kind of contentious period. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions from the audience, uh, and I'm happy to I'm happy to close the conversation here. Um, um, I think uh, some of our uh, attendants are also being recalled by family duty, so I'm, I'm happy to leave it here. Um, so thank you so much, Liz, for such a fascinating uh, seminar. It's a pity that we can't really clap properly in this space, but I've re greatly enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, from the comments uh, from the audience, it's clear that it's been very stimulating. Um, I wanted, before we go, just to uh, give a couple, flag up a, a couple of uh, bits of information. So um, just to advertise our next uh, seminar, uh, in which Oud player Alas Ritan will offer a lecture recital, uh, in which he will present us with a transcultural story of his own engagement with the Oud, and this will be followed by a Q&A. Uh, this is taking place on Monday, the 14th of December, from 2 to 4 p.m. UK time, and you can register on our website. I'm going to post also the registration link uh, on the chat in case you want to access that now. Um, also, just to remind you that you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and also that if you've missed any events and you want to catch up, you can uh, do so by uh, following our, our YouTube channel, uh, where we post uh, all our recorded talks a few days after they've taken place. So again, to thank you all for attending today, to thank our wonderful speaker, and we look forward to seeing you in our forthcoming events. Okay. Thank you so much.